welcome. Thank you so much for choosing my section, my session instead of the other two because they're quite interesting. So I appreciate it. So today I'm going to be talking about TypeScript and explore some of the tools in the TypeScript ecosystem. Uh, but before I do that, I obviously have to thank you the sponsors for making this event happening and also I would like to thank you Plain Concepts for counting on me and inviting me to speak today. My name is Rimo Jansen and I'm a full stop web engineer. I'm currently living in Dublin in Ireland, but I'm actually from the south of Spain. I'm from Seville. Um, um, I'm the author of Immersify.js, which is a popular open source IoT container for TypeScript applications. I will show you this later. I'm not going to go through all my details because I don't have much time today. So let's move on. Um, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, my second book was out, which is Learning TypeScript uh, 2x. And you can check it out in learningtypescript.com. And at the end of the session, I'm going to give you all a discount code that you can use to get 20% off. So. so today I'm going to basically explain what is TypeScript and why you should use it, or at least consider using it. Then I'm going to show how to get started with it. And I will also show why TypeScript allows us to use the, type, the JavaScript of tomorrow, and how we can work with the static type system of TypeScript. Then why TypeScript uh, love tools? And finally, I will answer any questions. So let's get started with what is TypeScript and why you should use it. So TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. This means that everything that you know about JavaScript is valid in TypeScript. Then it compiles to JavaScript. And it's exactly type. So when I say that it's a superset, Basically, you have everything that you have in JavaScript plus the static types. That's the extra bit that TypeScript adds to JavaScript. And you can run it in any IDE in any operating system. It's an open source project, and it's actually based on standards. So TypeScript follows the ECMAScript standards and all the specifications. Um, TypeScript has grown a lot in popularity in the last few years, so it's five years old in the public. It's actually, I think, seven years old in private. And in the last month, for example, it had 11 million downloads on NPN. That's in only one month. And in the previous year, in the Stack Overflow, it, the questions grew by 142%, which was so big that they did a, a study about the growth of Python, and they have to take out TypeScript of the study because it was basically breaking all the charts and everything. And it's today used by thousands of organizations. So these are some of them. You can check later the slides to see which ones are in particular, but there's a lot of very well-known ones. And it's also used by hundreds of open source projects. And some people might be surprised that Babel, for example, or Webpack use TypeScript, but in the last few months, they have actually started using it. So for example, Webpack is, uh, is using a feature that I will show later that Webpack is implementing it in JavaScript, but the TypeScript compiler is actually checking that the JavaScript types are correct. So it's not implemented TypeScript, but TypeScript still helps the project. And about why you should use it, so it allows you to use the latest uh, JavaScript features. It provides you with better tools. And it also helps you to have face less browser compatibility issues, also to face less bugs. It in improves your productivity. It can provide you with better documentation, allows you for better team collaboration. It's highly compatible with JavaScript. And the community of TypeScript has grown a lot and is very active. I'm going to try to demonstrate some of these benefits during the demos. So that is the, very, the, the first section about what is TypeScript. Now I'm going to try to show you how we can get started with it. So the, the easiest way to get started is actually to go to this website in the bottom, typescriptland.org, and go to the playground section. And you will see that website there. And then what you can do is in the left side, you can type TypeScript. And in the right side, you will see the JavaScript generated. So this is the fastest way to try it. If you have never tried it before, you just go to the website and, and give it a go. You don't need to install anything or nothing. 
Now, the most realistic way of trying it is actually to install it in your machine and use a real ID. So, the recommended ID, I, I believe, is Visual Studio Code. And the reason why I believe it's a recommended one is because it's actually developed by the same team in Seattle. So, the same guys that do TypeScript also do uh, Visual Studio Code. So, it's very highly well integrated. Uh, again, you can go to that website to, to download Visual Studio Code. And then, uh, that's only the editor, but you also need to install it in your machine, so you do it through NPM. NPM is the Node Package Manager, so you need, you need to install Node.js first, and when you install Node.js, it will include the Node Package Manager. Then, with the Node Package Manager, you, do, you can do NPM install minus G TypeScript, and what, will, what that will do is you have in your command line a command that is called TST, which stands for TypeScript Compiler. And from that moment, you can call TST to compile basically a TypeScript file. Uh, optionally, you can install TS Node. And TS Node basically is like Node.js, but understand TypeScript. So you, you don't need to compile and then run. You can directly run, OK? And then, obviously, you can use NPN also to install any other dependencies. So if you want to install, for example, underscore, which is a utility for working with collections and things like that, you can do NPN install save underscore, but in TypeScript, if the, if the package is a script library, you also need the types. So you need to install a second package, which is uh, add types slash and the name of the package. So you, you have to do uh, npm install save add types slash underscore. And that will, that will install the types for underscore. Um, the cool thing about TypeScript, as I say, is that everything you know about JavaScript is valid in TypeScript. And then since the version 2.3, right now in, we are in the version 2.8, so it's not so long ago, you can actually use JavaScript. You don't need to use TypeScript at all. You keep, you keep coding in, in .js files, but TypeScript can help you, okay? So I'm going to try to demonstrate that uh, in the first demo, okay? So here, okay, thank you. Uh, here I have basically in my console, I'm in a folder called demo, and it's completely empty right now. There's nothing there. Uh, and here in Visual Studio Code, I also have this uh, demo folder. Okay, so I'm going to create a new folder called source, and I'm going to create a file called uh, demo.js. So here I have my demo file. And say, for example, that I create a function, and it's called add. So it's just going to be a function that adds two numbers, nothing too complex. The problem in JavaScript, of course, is that we can make a mistake. So for example, if we pass uh, 5 and 5, it will work fine, right? But if we pass uh, strings, Maybe this was not what we expect, so this is actually going to return uh, 55 as a string, and this is going to return 10 as a number. So basically, this one is OK, but this one is not what we wanted, OK? So the problem is that in JavaScript, we cannot know that the error is there until we actually run the thing. But with TypeScript, basically, what we can do is we can add here uh, this comment. Sorry. A TS check, okay. And then we can add comments, which is the standard JavaScript comments. So we can say, um, that A is a number, and we can say that uh, B is also a number. And now TypeScript is actually detecting an error in JavaScript. So you can still code with JavaScript, but if you add that comment, you get the benefits of type checking, OK? <laughs> it's obviously not as powerful as TypeScript, but it can help you a lot. The other thing is that, for example, if I want to use a library, so if I want to use underscore, underscore has methods for filtering, for searching, but I don't get any kind of help here for auto-completion. 
but I can go and install uh, underscore. So what I'm going to do is create a package JSON. So I'm going to create a new package JSON. The package JSON is now here. Okay. Then I'm going to install underscore. And because it's not TypeScript, I'm doing JavaScript. I'm just going to install the, the module. I'm not going to install the type definitions. Okay, so that's installed there, uh, and I have it here in my dependencies. But now, when I go back to my code, I actually get uh, all the help, and this is because Visual Studio Code is actually fetching the type definitions as well. I didn't explicitly do it, but it's doing it for me, and it's giving me all the all the help that I need. So here I can now filter an array of numbers, for example, um, where one of the numbers, sorry, our function, okay, um, I think I'm missing the comma, right? Yeah, so I can filter like that. Now, if I wanted to go to, to TypeScript, I will rename this file. to TypeScript, I probably have to reload. <coughs> okay, so in TypeScript, basically, I don't want to use these comments because we have a, a different way of doing annotations for types, okay? So if I delete this, TypeScript is not going to complain, but this is because TypeScript by default is not very strict, but it's actually not the recommended way to doing it. So what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create the compilation file for TypeScript, uh, which is with TST uh, in it. So successfully create the TS config JSON. So I, that gives me this file, okay? Um, by default, the strict mode is true. And this actually is something that we should try to aim for. Because when the strict mode is on, TypeScript is going to be able to enforce much more type safety than the default one, okay? So if I go now to my file here, let's see why. Okay, so now here we have this error that basically is saying that TypeScript wants to know what is A. If I don't explicitly say what it is, it's going to complain because by default, the type assigned to things, if it's not able to detect it, is any, okay? So any is like an unknown type. It can be anything. So A can be a string, can be a number. So in both cases are valid, okay? But there's but there's a very cool feature that if you have a valid use case, so for example, if I have a unit test where I'm doing that, I can actually click here and go to this guy here, and I can say infer the types from the usage. So the function is used with numbers. Then TypeScript can detect that this must be numbers, okay? So when I do that, it automatically adds the definitions for me. And that way, I don't really have to type anything by hand. So this is the way, basically, you get started with it, both if you're doing JavaScript and if you're doing TypeScript. One thing that you will be missing here is that if you try to use underscore, it's now failing. And before, it was working. That's because in TypeScript, I actually have to install something else. So I have to do npm install uh, minus save dev add types, and then the name of the package. So if I do that, here in my package JSON, now I have two things. I have the, the actual library and the types for the library, OK? I have the two things. And in theory here, I should get help now. So underscore now gets the help as well, OK? So that's demo one. Uh, so now that we know the basics of how to get started and how to annotate things, I'm going to explain you all the kind of features that you can use from JavaScript. So these things are things that are not TypeScript. They are JavaScript, but they are not supported by all browsers today. But basic TypeScript allows you to compile to a previous version of JavaScript. So you can use something that is not available today and compile to a previous backwards compatible version, OK? So the first thing that you can use is classes. 
So classes was introduced by, by ECMAScript 2015. And under the hood, they are actually prototypes. So there's nothing new. But the, the, the good handy thing about this is that you can use the class keyword. And you can define a class like if you were in any other object or in the programming language. You don't have to do prototypes anymore, OK? So this, you can use this in TypeScript, but this is actually JavaScript. It's not, it's not a TypeScript feature, OK? Something that is TypeScript in this picture is actually the public keyword. So the public keyword will be a TypeScript thing. And the types, the colon string, is also TypeScript. But everything else is JavaScript. You can also use modules. So in, we have a lot of different kinds of modules in the last few years. We have required yes, common yes, but now there is an actual standard, which is the ECMAScript modules, and you can use them with TypeScript. So there's some examples of syntax there. And basically, you use the import and export keywords, and you can define what parts of the, of the module is imported and exported. Then you have generators. And generators is basically a tool that helps when working with some asynchronous code. And a generator is basically a function that has a special signature with a star symbol. I don't know if you guys can see it properly. Uh, here, it's fine, it's fine, thank you. So the, the star symbol and then the yield keyword. So what happens is when you call the function, it actually returns an iterator. And then you can call in the iterator next. So when you call next, it's going to stop in every single time that finds the yield keyword. So the first time we call next returns one, the second time returns two, and continues until there's no more. So when there's no more, you get a done true, and that's the end of it. And generators, it's, it's kind of tricky to use sometimes for asynchronous work, but it was actually needed for the next thing, which is async await. So async await, if you guys come from .NET background, you're probably very familiar with it. But the thing is that you can use async await in JavaScript. And again, this is not TypeScript. This is JavaScript. And in the next uh, few years, it will become native, and it will be supported by all browsers. So an example here, you can see that I have an async function that replaces files. And when I read from the file, I, I use the await keyword. So the, the benefit of async await is that the code that you write, the way you write it and read it, is it, it, it makes you feel like the code is synchronous, but it's actually asynchronous. So it's much more easy to understand and to follow. And then another feature that you can use from JavaScript is decorators. Um, so decorators are these annotations that you can see here, like at. And they are used to add some metadata to your code. So in this case, for example, I have a controller. And what I'm adding is the controller is a class. And I'm adding metadata to the class. And the metadata is basically the path that is going to be used to access this controller. So you can uh, uh, use the decorators to add metadata. And then you can use some tool to read this metadata. So in this case, this metadata is basically interpreted by a router. And the router basically links the paths to the controllers. So it's a very powerful thing to automate certain things. And there is much more. So if you want to check everything that is coming in JavaScript, you can go to that link. And in that link, you're going to be able to find all the current proposed features and what's the state of them. And you can check what, because once a feature uh, is proposed and reach a state three, is added to TypeScript. So you can know that if something is a stage three, it's probably available in TypeScript. And then all those things are JavaScript, but in TypeScript, you obviously have types. So now I'm going to show you some of the features of the TypeScript type system. Okay? The most simple one is the type inference and type annotations. So the type annotation is basically what I have shown earlier. You can you can basically put column and name of the type, and that's, an, that's a type annotation. And type inference is basically when you do, oops, sorry. When you declare a variable, so for example, here we do n equals 5. TypeScript is smart enough to understand that 5 is a number. So then n must be a number there. And that's type inference, OK? Then we have interfaces. And interfaces are very, very powerful because 
basically, let's say that you have a function that takes an, an object, and the object is called options. And the problem is that you don't know what options is, OK? You don't know what properties objects, uh, options have. This is one very common problem in JavaScript. So the only way you can figure out what option has is by going to the website of the library and investigating what properties are there. But if you have an interface, you can say that options is some interface, OK? And then automatically, you get auto-completion. You get documentation on the fly. You don't have to go to the library and check what it is. Also, it helps to coordinate work between teammates, because if, if my teammate is going to actually call my function, if we agree on the interface, he's going to be able to go ahead and, and, and write the code with, before I actually write, implement the interface. Okay, So it's a very powerful thing for coordination and documentation between teams. And one important thing is that in TypeScript, the, types, it, the type system is basically a structural. And the opposite is called nominal type system. And the thing is that if your function takes an interface and it's called options, OK? In c -sharp, for example, if you pass something to this function, that something must uh, implement the interface, right? And you have to explicitly use the keyword implement. So you have to say implements something. But in TypeScript, it's not like that. In TypeScript, if whatever you pass has the same structure, it's considered a match. So it's considered a valid implementation. So what I mean by that is that, for example, here, in this example, this uh, diffuse method okay, expects a vector. And here I have created a variable which doesn't use the type vector, but it match a vector because it has the same properties and the same types. So if it match the vector, it's, it's valid. It's not going to complain, even if I don't explicitly say that it's a vector. So it's match against the structure, not match against the names. Okay. Then we have unions and intersections. And for example, here we have two interfaces. We have bird and fish. And when you use the union, you use this or type here. And basically what we're saying is that pet is a fish or, or a bird. So what this means is that only the properties that are in both, so in this case, both types have lay x, that is OK. Because if you do an or, it's in either of both. So you can, you can access lay x, and that's OK. But if you try to access one of exclusively of one of the types, you're going to get an error, because it's not guaranteed that that property exists in both. Okay. Oops. And the intersection type uses the AND operator. And it's basically kind of the opposite. So you have something that is, at the same time, is a fish and a bear. So you get all the properties that are shared, and also all the properties that are inclusive to only one of those types. And these things are useful sometimes because you can say, for example, I want to take something as an argument that is both a service and serializable. So you will use and. But if it's, uh, I don't know, something that is um, only two of them, something that is serializable or not, for example, you can use the, the union type with the or operator. Then basically, the TypeScript type system is actually quite complex. And it's very advanced. So one thing that you can do is, uh, going back to the same example, in here, if you have a method that takes a pet and can be one of the two, actually the method is this one. So if you have a method called move, so you know that sometimes you have to call fly, but sometimes you have to call swim. The problem is if you try to call fly directly, you're going to get an error because it's not guaranteed that it has a fly. Okay, so you have to check first what it is, if it's a bird or if it's a uh, fish, right? So TypeScript is actually smart enough and understands this if. So basically, at the top of the function, the type is or fish or bird. But inside the if, TypeScript knows that it's a, a bird. It knows that it's the right type, because it's smart enough to understand the if statement. So it says, if this if statement is true, then inside the if, the type is no longer fish or bird. It's now only bird, OK? And the way you do one of these uh, if statements, you basically have to write a function, 
And the important part is the return. So you have to say, that you have to check, if, uh, you have to basically check something inside. In this case, I'm checking if the object pet has a property swim, okay? So if that is true, in the type system, I say that the pet is a bird. And, and that's how the type system is able to understand this if um, statement. So the, the fact that TypeScript is able to understand what's going on in the if statements is called control flow analysis. And the if statement is called type guard. Um, then you also have generics. So if you're familiar with C Sharp, you have basically the ability to define a type that is unknown uh, when you're writing the code. So going here to the example, I have a queue. And I don't know if the queue is going to be a queue of number, of a queue of persons, or a queue of cars. I don't know. So I'm going to call the items of the queue t, t and then I can basically add items to the to the queue. So it's push an item, and the item must be of type t. And then I can also take one item out of the queue with pop, and what returns is one t. Okay. And here below, when actually somebody creates an instance of this thing needs to specify the type. So in this case, we're creating a queue of number. And in this case, we're creating a queue of a string. And TypeScript, obviously, is going to be able to detect the error. If somebody tried to use add a string to the queue of number, we're going to get an error. So the, the advantage of this thing is that you don't need to know the, the types uh, when you define something. And you also don't have to use type, type casting. So there's no casting involved in this. Then we have literal types, the key of operator and lookup types. And this is, this is a very advanced feature. So let me see if I can try to explain it. So the first one is literal types, which when you define a variable with let, this variable uh, can change, OK? It's not a constant. So you can do let n1 equals 5, and then later on you can do n1 equals 6, and that's not going to be an error. So TypeScript thinks that that is a number, because it can change to a different number, OK? But when you use, when you use const uh, in, the, in, the, in this line here with n2, 5, then the type is not number. The type is actually the number 5. And this is called a literal type. Uh, this is very useful for certain cases. So for example, imagine if you're defining the, the type for a CSS selector or something. And you can say that the, the alignment of some paragraph can only be left, center, or right. So it can only be those three types, instead of saying it's a string. Because if you say that it's a string, somebody can put maybe top, right? But if you say it can only be the string left, the string center, and the string right. So those are the only three types that can take. And then the key of operator is used to get the names of the properties of an object. So I have of a type, sorry. So I have a type here. The type person has name and age. When I call key of, I get the union of name and age. Okay? So I get both. And then below here, this is a very advanced use case. I have a method to find something in an array, OK? So the array is an array of t. And then the, the people is, all, is also going to give me a key. So for example, they are going to give me an array of people, of person. And they're going to say, I want to filter by name. So they're going to, here below, you can see how they call. Uh, find an array, they give me an array of people, and the key h. And the value is the, la is the third argument. We have this thing here that basically what we're saying is that the value must be the value of the property which has been selected. So if we select if we select age, then there must be a number. But if we select select name and we pass a number, we get an error. So TypeScript is smart enough to know which key we have selected and what type must be. Um, so this is a a way to kind of create very advanced uh, type uh, cases, OK? And then we have the latest addition, which is uh, conditional types. And in conditional types, we use the question mark. And we can say, basically, we can ask the type system if something is of a type. So we can say, for example, 
Here we have a type that is to transform a type into a read-only version of the same type, okay? So what we do is, if we, if we have a person, this type here, what we do is, if it's, it's deeply nested, so what we do is, if it's name, should we make it read-only or not? And it's no. If, if name is a string, we return a string. So that is done here, we say, if t, t is the property, okay? If t is a primitive, we just return t. So um, primitives is a string number, boolean, undefined, or null, okay? So name is a primitive, it's a string, so we just return a string. Age is a primitive, it's number, we just return the string. But address is an object. So address is not a primitive. In that case, what we do is, is the third case here, because the second case, if it's an array. So if it's an array, we transform it as read-only array. Uh, and if it's an object, we call the same function, so it's recursive, okay? So below, uh, in, the, in this case, in followers, person, basically what we're going to get back is an array, a read-only array of person, okay? So if we call, if we create a new type called read-only person and we call deep read-only object of person, the type that we get is this one here. So if you compare the first with the second, see uh, a string, a still a string, but now it's read-only, uh, age, a still number, but it's read-only, and for example, array, the type has changed to read-only array. So this is a very powerful tool to map one type to a different type and things like that, based on certain logic, okay? And you have some of these types built in in the language. I'm not going to go through them, but basically you have five types that you can use. They are already built in the language, so you don't have to write these types yourself. The, the read-only is one of them. So you, if you want to make a read-only version of something, you just call it. You don't have to create a read-only type. The same thing for uh, conditional types. So you have already four conditional types, no, five predefined conditional types. So for example, one is uh, one can be used to extract the return the type of the return of a given function. So if you want to know what is the return type of a function, you can use the return type conditional type. And there's actually much more. So if you go to go through all the TypeScript uh, type system features, you can check that uh, URL and there's, it's called basic types, but in the left side of the page, you actually have a list of all the features, even not the basic ones. So I'm going to go to demo two. And in demo two, I'm going to show a, a kind of real world application that use a lot of these things together, okay? So I'm going to go through as many as I can, and I have a demo three as well, so I'm just going to spend a few minutes on it. But it's going to be online in GitHub, so you can check it later on. Um, I have to open the project. So, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to the folder where I have this. Uh, So I'm going to call the command uh, npn start, okay? And this is going to run the application. So it's going to use this tool, this tool called uh, called no daemon, and the no daemon what it's doing is it's watching my files. If I change something in my files, it's going to automatically restart the server for me. So what we can see here, once the application has run, is first we are loading some object relational mapping entities. So in this case, I have two entities, user and tweet. Then we're loading some repositories, which is basically to do queries to the database. So we have a repository for tweet and a repository for user. Then we're loading some controllers. And I have three controllers. I have one for authentication, one for tweets, and one for user. And finally, we're running the app, OK? So if I go here to the code, I have a front end and a back end, by the way, in the package JSON. We can see the start command, so I just call no daemon. And no daemon is actually calling TS node, which is what I mentioned earlier, that you can run without compiling first, okay? So you can run TypeScript directly. 
Um, so in my front end, I have um, song helpers. Let me see if I can show you. So I have this function called get, get HTTP utils, and I have some methods. I haven't finished this, so you can add delete and other methods, okay? Then I have some headers. And basically, I have a query fetch. So not, I don't know if you guys know the fetch function, OK? So the fetch function is used to do an AJAX call and get some data from the server. But this function takes an URL and some options, OK? And I found myself doing a lot of copy paste. So I have to do the same, same options again and again, headers and things like this. So I wanted to reduce the amount of code that I have to write. So in this file, basically, what I'm trying to show showcase is that TypeScript also works quite well with functional programming, not just with object-oriented programming. So in this in this case, basically, I have a courier fetch, which is basically the same thing, but I have split it into many functions. So the first function takes a method, you can see here. And the method m must be one of the keys of methods. So that means that the method must be or get or post. If it's not one of those, I'm going to get an error, OK? Then I pass the method, and when I get back, it's another function. So the second function is this one here. And this, the second function takes the headers, OK? When I pass the headers, I get another function. And the other function takes the URL, OK? And again, when I pass the URL, I get another function. And what, I get, what the last function takes is the body and the token, OK? So this might seem a little bit tricky and weird, but once you have this guy, you can basically, if I call one time with the method, I get back a function, but that function is already a post, so I call it HTTP post. When I call it with a get, I get another function, and I call it HTTP get. If I call these guys without headers, I get another function, which is now a get with no custom headers, or a post with no custom headers. So this is just a helper that in, in one line I can create new functions. And when I, write, when I write my client, it's actually very simple. I just say HTTP post with no custom headers. And I say I'm going to post an user. And I'm going to get an user back. And this is the URL. So this gives me a function called create users that I can call here. I can say client create users and, and get it. So by doing functional programming, I can use one function to generate many other functions. And this is a way to reuse code, OK? So TypeScript works quite well with functional programming. Now, if I go to the back end, as I say, I first load the entities. Then I create a database connection. And then I create a container. And the container is the IOC container, OK? So it's a dependency injection library, and it's called Inversify.js. So basically, what the container is doing here, IOC container, basically what we do is we create a new container, and then we load, uh, basically for each entity, we create a repository, and we're creating a type for that. So we're using container bind repository of something to the actual implementation. And in controllers, we're doing the same thing. We're loading the controllers and creating bindings, OK? So this code is something that you write once for mapping all the repositories and all the controllers. But once you do that, uh, you can basically, if you, if you want to create a new service, all you have to do is go to entities. And you can define an entity. So in this case, for example, we have a tweet. And here you can see how TypeScript is using a lot of features. So TypeScript is using modules. Uh, it's using decorators, OK? So we're adding metadata. And this metadata is actually used by the database. So it's used to create foreign keys, to create primary keys. So this is a use case of decorators. We use decorators to add metadata that is needed for mapping to tables, OK? Then once you have this uh, entity, the, the thing is actually going to generate the, the repository automatically. OK, you don't have to do it. It's using the metadata to do that. And finally, you have to create a controller. So if you create a controller, your controller is going to look like this. We have an, an annotation for the controller. And it's just a class that extends base HTTP controller. 
And here we have, for example, how we do a HTTP GET. So we use async. And what we do is we await this tweet repository find, and we find by, by user, sorry, with the user. Um, and here, for example, we have an injection of a dependency. So we are injecting the tweet repository. So you have dependency injection, you have async await, and if you guys are familiar with .NET, this looks extremely like ASP.NET, but it's actually Node.js. Uh, so this is one of the things that helps .NET developers if you move towards this. It's, it should be very easy and fast for you to learn this framework. Um, so that I'm going to speed to demo three because I only have 10 minutes. So, but this ex this whole app is going to be in GitHub, so you can check all the details, and I'm available in Twitter if you guys want to ask any questions. So the last thing that I want to show is that TypeScript really, really loves tools. And what I mean by this is that you get a very good user experience when you're working in TypeScript, so you get auto-completion, you get like um, a lot of help when you're developing and makes you more productive. But that's not the end of the story, and there's something that not a lot of people know, and it's that TypeScript, basically the, the actual compiler has been built with tools in mind from the fir very first day, and you have APIs that you can access. So for example, you have the language service API, and the language service API has been designed uh, especially for, for the people who create editors and IDEs to basically connect to TypeScript and add help to your whatever tool you're building, okay? So examples of this is that, for example, you can create an online editor, and TypeScript is JavaScript, so you can run TypeScript in, in the browser, the, the compiler, okay? And in the in the editor in the in the browser, you could get autocomplete, you could get help, so you could get an experience that feels like Visual Studio in a website. Okay, so if you're developing some kind of tool like that, this is useful. And you can also access the compiler APIs. So the compiler internally has some phases. So the first thing that does is scans your JavaScript code, which this thing called the scanner, and generates a string of tokens. And then the tokens is transformed into an abstract syntax tree, AST. And this abstract syntax tree, then the binder basically identifies symbols within it. And then the checker finally checks the abstract syntax tree and the symbols and makes sure that the types are correct. And if everything is correct, you get the JavaScript code, which is generated by the emitter, OK? And this is compiler internals and compiler theory. and. May, many of you might be wondering why is this useful. Uh, the thing is you can learn it quite easily by going to this website, tsastbware.com. And in this website, if you type TypeScript in the left side, in the right side you can actually see the symbols, the abstract syntax tree, you can see everything. So you can, by trial and error, you can learn how everything works internally, okay? You don't need to study a lot. If you just write a line of code and see what is generating, you can, you can guess what's going on. So this is important because in the future, compilers are going to be a big deal in web development. And basically, I, I, I like this quote from Tom Dale, which is a, a recognized pe people, person in the JavaScript community. And he says that compilers are the new frameworks. And his advice is that if you want to make an impact in web development in the future, it's time to learn about compilers, OK? And the reason why this is happening is because for, if you have types, you have information that is very valuable. And for example, you can do things like optimize your code more. So you can create a compressor that is more efficient than one that doesn't have types. So what is going to happen is the frameworks like Angular, React, all these frameworks are going to start to use more and more the metadata from the compilers. So in the future, Something that is a compiler is going to be more, much, much more efficient and automated as something that doesn't use a compiler. So compilers are going to become more and more popular in, in JavaScript. And compilers is a very computer science topic, difficult to understand. But with TypeScript, that's not the case. Actually, if you go to that website, everybody can understand what's going on. And the last demo, I'm going to show you an example of that. So I created a tool. I'm going to stop this. Yeah, please. So using the library TS Simple AST, I created a tool that basically what it does is it reads my, my TypeScript code 
and reads the abstract syntax tree and use that to identify, basically use that to find the classes in my code and to find the names of the properties and to find, it basically finds what is in my code, okay? And it transforms my code into a picture, okay? So here I'm calling the TSUML that gives me the, it's finding files, okay? So what happens is, it's finding some files in my code, it's finding all the files in the backend, and gives me a UML diagram, okay? So I'm going from TypeScript code uh, to UML di diagram. And this is actually extremely simple. I don't have time to show the code, but I will share it. And basically what you do is, you import uh, the parser from TS simple AST, and you say, where are your files? And it gives you back an abstract syntax tree, and the abstract syntax tree has a method that is give me the classes. So you get the classes, and then for each class, you can say give me the methods, and you get the methods. You do two for loops, and you get a picture with your code. So you can create very cool tools without knowing nothing about compilers, which is amazing. And sorry to finish. Zoom out. So, any questions? No? Okay, so maybe I go and show you how I have time. So I show you the code of the the, the parser, okay? Uh, file, open file. Uh, sorry. So basically what I'm doing is I'm importing AST and simple AST from this guy, TS simple AST. I have a function that is called get AST. So I pass the compilation um, options file and then the files that I want to parse, okay? And what I get back is an AST. So all I'm doing is I'm calling new AST with the, comp the, the file for the compilation settings and the files that I want to parse. And then, for example, this one is for parse the class. So I get the class declarations, which I find in another file, and I do it by calling AST get class declarations. So I get all the classes, and then I call this function for each class. And to get the class name, for example, I, I just call cl class declaration um, get symbol get name. To get the properties, I say class declaration get properties. To get the methods, class declaration get methods. And then all I do is a loop. For each property, I get the name, and for each uh, method, I get the name. And finally, I return the class name, the class properties, and the class methods. So it's it's very user friendly. It's not and obviously I get auto completion, I get errors, I get help. So this this was actually easy enough to put together. Um, so thank you very much, and that's the discount code for the book. If you want to check it out. Thank you.